It's here. It's new. USA Today just named it one of the 10 best city art districts in the Basically country. the place where First Friday happens, and it's also known as an artsy vibe. And as we found out, the folks who live and work down there, they aren't resting on their laurels. Over the course of the past five, 10 years, there's been this ongoing question of who is Phoenix? You know, what is our identity? And as a young city, that might be difficult to navigate towards, especially when there's so many ways to define what that is. But I think when people start being brave and start saying, you know what, this is who I am, then you as an individual, you are part of that community. Phoenix is its people, I think. Truth. It's its people. It's the people came before us, it's the people are going to be after us, it's the people living in it now. It's what we do in it, it's what we bring to it. It's the people. There's a reason that places like Portland are blowing up right now because they, they've nailed the, their identity. They, they, they know who they are. We're, we're almost there. We're on our way. We just need to really commit to who we are. And I think that's one of the, the things we're trying to figure out right now. What do we want to be when we grow up? Phoenix is in that growth spurt right now. We're in that beginning phase. So we don't really have that pinpoint thing that we are. And I don't think we need to be. That's what I think the major problem with Phoenix. They're always trying to, we're trying to be something when can't we just be what we are? You know, it really isn't anything. Phoenix is just Phoenix. You talk about Arizona, you talk about the Grand Canyon, you talk about Sedona, but in the city of Phoenix there wasn't really that one place where wow, the wow factor. And I think it's really the arts community that has created not just one area, but it's the whole city. There's a feeling in the air, there's sunshine everywhere in Arizona. I taste a thousand yesterdays and I love the magic. When my parents came here, it was, it was dubbed as vacation land, palm trees everywhere and water and pools and it was like that's what you did, you never left vacation. And you could swim in the canal and it was all pimped out, it was like Arizona's beach. My parents used to ride their bikes up Grand Avenue and that was like the happening thing. You had to go shopping, JCPenney's or wherever, you came downtown. And then the 80s, it was gone, it was ghost town, four o'clock, it was empty. It was like, you could do whatever you wanted down here because no one was here. In the 40s and 50s, it was, it was a hopping place. You know, downtown was great. Department stores and dance halls and boxing rings. And there was all sorts of stuff to do in downtown for a very long time. But through most of my childhood and early adulthood, downtown was absolutely nothing. For most people, the city closed down after five o'clock. I mean, there were a few things going on, but not things that were really uh, on the up and up or even legal. There were a lot of crack houses in the neighborhood and a lot of them were more across the alley from us or across the street from us. A lot of the houses in the Roosevelt area were depleted, uh, crime-ridden. Um, people wouldn't come down here to experience anything because there was nothing to experience. It was a fairly dangerous area. We had bullets come through our kitchen, into our stove, lodged into our stove. Just, you know, people drive by shootings, just going out and shooting their guns. It was, it was just such a, um, a different experience for kids growing up in the 70s and 80s. I came down after school, I skateboarded down here. I thought that was pretty extraordinary because I had the time to myself. You start small and you build on it. What comes first, the market or the people that need a market? So what happened is all of a sudden this excitement came and the arts community started to move into downtown and it just became an organic process where galleries started to come up and mural artists started to paint on on business walls there were the right circumstances there was the historic equity there was a there was a void there was no real arts district 
there was a, a real need for you know this huge city to have its urban core, and um, and there were you know there was some some kind of crazy kids that really wanted that. They wanted a music scene. They wanted an art scene. There was no cops down here. We would play music till five or six in the morning, till the sun came out, until we wanted to. My audience at the time was the pimps and the prostitutes and the homeless, but it was, I mean, just as valid because, you know, I'm sure those guys see some crazy stuff, and if my art stops them in their tracks, that's probably a good thing. We have homeless people that I've known in this neighborhood for 20 years that are actually as much a part of the neighborhood as we are. They live here, but they live on the streets, you know. The whole point of having a community is interaction learning from your neighbor, you know, having that experience. If you basically, uh, you know, connect with the people around, if you actually treat the people around like, you know, they're part of the community too, then I don't have to worry about coming out in the middle of the night and having my car smashed up or something like that. Today I took a walk down the street down Grand Avenue just to kind of get the feel for old times and um, I found a Java magazine, which is our local art magazine on the ground. And I had heard that my picture was in the back. So I flipped through it, found my picture in there. And it was all wet and nasty, so I kind of threw it back into the shopping cart. Got down to the end of the block and came back. When I got back, these two homeless guys were looking through it. And instead of just like walking by, not saying anything, I told it was like, hey dude, my picture's in there. And they opened it and I'm like, right here, man. And they looked at it and they're like, oh, that's cool, you know? And then they were like, we're gonna keep this. You know, so instead of just walking by and not saying anything, you know, it's like, now I know that, you know, it's, you have these, great experiences with every with everyone. It was just by extraordinary luck that we kind of all came together and really rolled up our sleeves and tried to figure out how to do it. We have been able to do almost innocently, you know, we, it was not like this grand plan we had, but was to purchase some buildings to secure them, to fix them up so that other people could see the vision of what could happen with these buildings and that they don't need to be torn down. I lived here in this very building about 12 years ago when uh, it was a whole different world here. It was, it was just a few artists and a couple of these buildings. Rents were really cheap. The building that's across the street over there, that used to be abandoned and uh, Beatrice owns that building now and she converted it into art studios. We added some windows, we added some doors, we did a lot of renovation on the building and then after we fixed it up, people were like, oh, this is a great building, this is wonderful. But before it was fixed up, a lot of people just felt like it should be torn down because it was boarded up and it was an eyesore. You have to be able to have the vision of taking something and what it's going to look like when it's fixed up. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't have that vision. The first place is our home. You know, we, we eat and sleep there and, and have our family. And that's where the majority of our, our life is focused. The second place is work. You know, that's eight hours a day for most of us, sometimes more sometimes a lot more. Third places are where we, we congregate. They're the churches, they're the markets, they're the galleries. And that's where we learn. That's where we grow and become human. That's where we interact and, and find love and we find art and we expand our horizons. It's where we dream. It's where we have great ideas. Third places are magic. And that's, you know, that's, that's what cities are, are for. Cities are for third places. Roosevelt Road's very new, it's very young. It's, it's really only 12 or maybe 15 years old now. We have all these old houses, all these old crappy buildings that no one wants. And these artists moved in and they're like, oh no, I can make a gallery out of this. I can make a store out of this. I can make a coffee shop out of this. I can make a nacho stand out of this. I made a conscious decision to be on Roosevelt simply because it looked like the spot to me where an arts district could blossom. This neighborhood has become more of a destination and I feel like the galleries, the coffee shops, everything has been coming together and it feels like one neighborhood. It's one thing to, to go shopping at the mall, it's another thing to walk the streets and, and meet the people who not only are invested in what you're looking for, but perhaps they made it as well. by the shadow of a city that I am a stranger in. 
So I will search for shelter in the things that remind me of home. First Friday sprung from, really sprung, sprung from Art Detour. Art Detour was once a year. Then First Fridays evolved, and that was once a month, the first Friday of every month. And around 2000, that blew up. That went from 100 or so people a month to about 5,000 that first year. In 2002, about 10,000 the next year. It really just exponentially uh, blew up on itself. Obviously, the Roosevelt and the First Friday thing is just the people, the madness, the, the crusty little spaces that have become art spaces. It's the, the smell of dope. First Friday is, is definitely, um, you know, our, our biggest night. And every month, it's, it's kind of the, the day that we prepare for. It's everybody. It's not just the art collectors and the people that are art connoisseurs. So it's like, you'll get people that come in and start touching the paintings and like, getting their photos taken in front of them and just saying whatever comes to their minds. Whereas, you know, the art crowd is a little more subdued and, you know, talking about things in a very academic way. And so first Friday, I could be a fly on the wall and totally hide out in here. And nobody really knew that I was the artist. I love first Fridays. I come to first Fridays every first Friday. That's a lot of first Fridays. <laughs> For first timers on first Friday, uh, I'd first kind of like gauge their personality. I I've seen some like white <laughs> honestly say some shit like, I don't want to go to downtown, you know? I'm downtown, no! Like, pe like, like <laughs> people don't steal from me and shit. If it's like a family with little kids, I'd probably say, hey, come early. You know, come before the sun sets. That's when you're going to see, you know, everyone kind of setting up. But I want to be a phoenix. That's where the culture at in AZ. Really? Honestly, everybody. Like, you see everybody here. It's still friendly at that time um, and there's not a lot there's not a huge crowd and this is a place where you can just be yourself and just do anything like have fun if it's a couple of young college kids that just moved here I'd probably tell them to come later when the hustle and bustle is going on I feel like I've lived more here for the last hour than I have over there for like the last month honestly uh, just to experience that that just surge of energy that is pretty cool that this city can have Uh, here in Phoenix, downtown Phoenix, we've got kind of two major art hubs where there's a concentration of artists and studios and galleries. So this is Grand Avenue. Roosevelt Row is kind of the, it's the spot where um, most people know about. That's where they go. It's kind of a safe place now, whereas Grand is kind of on the fringe still. And it's a little edgier. It's where you'll go and kind of have to do a little exploration to find stuff. Having art in neighborhoods like in Grand Avenue um, has helped the neighborhood a lot. This is a unique festival in that it's a walking festival. Some people have wanted to close the street down, and my whole thing is, look, if you close the street down, people are going to stay in those two blocks. They're going to you know, expect everything to be divvied up to them. Here's the craft booth. You can look at this. You can look at that. I think people actually have more fun if it's interactive, and they get to go out, and they get to discover, and they get to find things. Studios are open. The, the stores, you know, like the restaurants are participating and showing art on the walls. Um, there's going to be a parade later, that kind of thing. And it really just draws attention to the fact that there's an art scene here on Grand as well. Even though it's like pulling teeth getting applications back from people. Uh, once people got into it, they submitted their applications, they, they all got very busy fixing up their spaces, finishing things that they hadn't had time to do. They were cleaning the exterior of their buildings. They were, you know, making things to hang inside. So it really created this whole community feeling of people that maybe don't talk to each other that often. Beatrice is mind-blowing for this community. She is Grand Avenue. She owns most of Grand Avenue. I shouldn't say that, but she owns a lot of buildings on Grand Avenue. And she's really heavy into the city. She's really talking and interacting and working for us, you know? It's nice to have a, a big guy in our side, you know, as an artist, keeping it ours. If it hadn't been me saying, okay, we need to have these meetings, we gotta get people on board to help with this festival this year, and been the person who's overseen to make sure everything gets done and that, you know, we've got people in there working on stuff. 
it would not have happened. Beatrice had kind of started ArtLink and started the, um, you know, our detour back in the day, years ago. And now she's become kind of the, uh, what they call her, the Grand Dam of, uh, of Grand Avenue. My partner and I own several buildings along Grand Avenue. As a matter of fact, we have eight properties along Grand. We rent mostly to artists and small businesses. And I also run the Frontal Lobe Gallery, the Kooky Craft Shop, which I'm getting ready to close, and I have a couple studios down here as well. She has a great goal because she wants to keep it low rent for artists. She wants work live spaces. She doesn't want to take Grand too high. She's really thinking outside the box and thinking long term. There weren't any other artists up here when we came up here and we were fine with that. <laughs> That's not what we were looking for. You know, we didn't want to be in an arts district. We just kind of want to be left alone and do so we could do our art projects. And uh, different people, you know, gravitate to neighborhoods like this for different reasons. People here, they don't like to drive very far. They like to just go to one spot and get out and walk around in that place. Parking is important and all that kind of thing. But like in Los Angeles, you'll drive an hour to go see one show for an hour and go home. So, so here in Phoenix, I think Grand Avenue and Roosevelt are perfect places for people to kind of come in mass and see a lot of work all at once. There are some people who've come here who are having problems because they're not embracing that sort of eclectic nature of the neighborhood and they're expecting it to be something other than what it is. It's not Scottsdale. You know, that's what makes it nice. It's not, you know. So things have changed really quickly, but we do still have our edge. Like at night, there's still, I mean, there's still kind of a, a scary element. You know, you gotta, gotta watch your back. I mean, but it's funny because I'll go out to my car and I'll have my backpack and like think any minute, it's like the old days, like somebody's gonna come out of the bushes or something, you know? Don't come here if you're expecting a really super clean and tidy neighborhood. This neighborhood is funky and it's got a lot of diversity. So come here if you're, if you're into that and help us create some fun things here, but don't come here to try to push everybody else out, <laughs> which is, I hear that, you know, where they really want to change the whole dynamic of the neighborhood. <laughs> Cadia CC started as an idea. Chef Salvana was commissioning a mural in the back of a restaurant. I was waiting tables there at the time, and Enardo Garcia, another local artist, was friends with Chef Salvana, and she was trying to figure out what can we do amongst all this hate that was going on, all this bad press. She sat down with me and Enardo, and we came with the idea of just painting murals. And we wanted to do showcase the beauty of Phoenix and the talent and we always said we can't fight hate with hate so instead of getting angry and doing stuff that's destructive why don't we get angry and do stuff that's positive and we started commissioning murals and getting artists together and we started one mural and then we moved on to the next and to the next and I think we have a good 30 or 40 murals that we've finished since we started. It's still really hard for an artist to make a living as an artist here. I mean, I, I see myself a fairly successful artist. I made a good name for myself and I'm always working, but I'm struggling. You get kind of jaded here and you get bitter and then that comes out when you know, you're talking to these people and they're, no one's buying my stuff, no one's, this town's crazy. And that, that comes out too, you can't look at it that way. You, you gotta be positive and stay true to yourself. People want that. I don't want the negative. I want that positive vibe. I want to buy that positive vibe. I want to bottle it, own it. And if that artist is giving it off, yeah, man, I want. That's what I want. 
things are changing. The end all isn't to get a gallery now. The end all is to just figure out how to fund your own work. Artists are willing to live in places other people aren't because they can look at something and see what it can be instead of what it is and they develop it and make it more interesting and make it creative. I mean, we can see that happening in our neighborhood right now. There's always the, the idea that artists move in, gentrify the space, and then all these, you know, Starbucks moves in, whatever, and then we're all, we all have to move. Sometimes when gentrification starts to happen, it's, it's like a snowball. It just, you know, kind of wipes out everything in its way. You sit down on a map and say, this is where the art district's gonna be, this is where the hipsters are gonna be, this is where the nice restaurants are gonna be. It can never happen. It has to happen organically. Pretty much every other city that I've been to, they've allowed all the artists to get kicked out of where it started. You have to get involved because honestly, at the end of the day, it's the people who have the money to develop things who are gonna develop things. What happens with a lot of developers is that it's a business to them. They don't live in the neighborhood. To them, it's all about penciling and how much money can I make off this project. Some of those people actually do care and they are reasonable and they would work with people if they realize like, I'm gonna be viewed as this horrible person who came in and just crushed this. You think of these other art markets, you think of these other cities, they didn't get together in a committee and say, this is what we're gonna do to be real. It's just they were all real and boom, it shot up and became something that people are attracted to. That's what I think Phoenix needs more of. That people doing real things, which we have and which is happening. People doing real things and staying true to themselves and just see, having their vision and just wanting to do it here and propelling themselves. And then once you get a bunch of that banded together, you get that positive energy that's real that people want a part of, then that's when we're gonna create our own thing. Unfortunately, artists aren't really big on getting involved with like city planning meetings or neighborhood meetings. You know, they're, they're so focused on their art or being creative or they look at those meetings as like the man and they don't wanna go to those meetings, they don't want to speak out, they don't want to get involved because it's political and our system doesn't work. Phoenix needs to have people. And it needs to have stores, shops, restaurants. It needs to have a normal local economy. We need to nourish the art scene. We need to feed our artists so they don't have the need to leave. They can make a living here, stay here and strive. We don't have to jump shit. We don't have to leave, we don't have to go to LA, we don't have to go to New York. Those are great places but they've been established for so long, it's like snore, boring. Let's make it happen here where it's not happening. If we make this part of our city so valuable because we are here, they won't be able to get rid of us. We could be an extraordinarily different city in 10 years if we, if we build the downtown right. Uh, we could be a city that, that could be a model for the new American, the new American city. Lots are everywhere, and they always are everywhere, and it's like Phoenix just can't seem to get rid of them. There's so much land, it's just, there's, it's, it's always there. I am shocked at how many empty lots there are, are, are over there now. They're tearing things down right and left. When you see so many vacant lots downtown, a, a lot of people think that there's nothing to do down here, or that it's, uh, it's dead, or it's not growing. My initial reaction is what wasted potential it has. And then my secondary reaction is, what a wonderful opportunity. True to an artist, you know, you see a vacant lot as a blank canvas. So what can we do to celebrate this space, to celebrate the desert, and to bring people together? All the spaces could be gardens or greenery or some type of activated space. I think it would really enrich our city until there is something built there. Most downtowns don't get a second shot and really building themselves. Once they start getting filled up, all of a sudden the things that we have are going to become precious. I'm all for things being built, city coming up, 
I want us to be a real city. I want it to be congested with buildings. I want to walk through and not have sun on me because there's so many buildings blocking the sky that the sun cannot hit me anymore. Just because they're vacant doesn't mean that the, the first solution is the, the best solution. On the same note, I don't think it's merited to get up in arms every time a building goes up in a dirt lot. It's a dirt lot. Like, if we want our city to grow, we have to let buildings go up. I mean, have you been to New York? There's a few buildings there. <laughs> they had to get built sometime. We shouldn't be building just because somebody's anxious to put some new condos in. It's got to be the, the first rule is first do no harm. It's the domino effect that people have to understand. You allow one of these, it's not just going to be one, it's going to be a whole bunch of them. Because what you have is a bunch of developers, who, that's all they can see is how much money they can make. You know, you can kill an Orange District fairly quickly with the wrong development.